Top of the day to you here in Senegal and to you there in Nigeria, the Gambia, Sierra Leone, Liberia and in the Americas. Thank you for joining us on this edition of your News and Current Affairs program, Weekly Top News, where we examine developing stories and news from the African perspective. This program is coming to you from West Africa, Democracy Radio, 94.9 FM, The Car, Senegal, and on our partner stations across the sub region. Well, let's remind you that you can get previous episodes of this program on our website, wadr.org, Audio Mac, and SoundCloud. I am Imo Edit, your anchor. Welcome. This week, we saw the severing of diplomatic ties by members of the Sahel Alliance states of Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso with Ukraine. While the nationwide demonstration in Nigeria dominated headlines. Well, let's briefly review these stories as we join Ogebirika for more. Hello, Oge. Hi, Imo and dear listener. As you heard that diplomatic issues dominated the week, starting with Mali, where the transitional government has announced the immediate severance of diplomatic relations with Ukraine. In a statement, Malian authorities condemned comments made by Ukrainian officials which they claim promotes terrorism in Mali. They also announced that they will notify the relevant judicial authorities about these remarks. Malian authorities are calling on the international community to respond. Agustin Coley has the details. In a statement broadcast on national television ORTM, Malian authorities condemned comments made by the spokesperson for the Ukrainian Intelligence Service and the Ukrainian ambassador to Senegal regarding recent events in Tinzawa 10 in the north of Mali. According to the transitional authorities, these comments promote terrorism in the country. Consequently, Mali has decided to immediately sever diplomatic relations with Ukraine. This announcement was made by the Minister of State and Government Spokesperson, Colonel Abdullahi Maigar. Following the recognized and acknowledged involvement of Ukraine in the leadership of Mali, the transitional government of Mali has decided on the following measures. The suspension of diplomatic relations between Mali and Ukraine. Ukraine has unfortunately entrusted its fate to individuals who confuse the international stage with a theatrical stage. Legal actions by the competent judicial authorities will be taken in response to statements made by the ambassador, which are considered acts of terrorism and support for terrorism. Exactly. Terrorism. The Malian authorities also call on the international community to take responsibility for Ukraine's actions. Mali calls on the international community to take responsibility and hold the Kremlin accountable for supporting terrorism in a global context. The situation requires strong unity and an urgent response to combat the growing threat. Combat ce flou. The diplomatic tension between Mali and Ukraine arose following statements by the head of the Ukrainian intelligence services expressing support for the separatist movement of the permanent strategic framework. Similarly, Niger's military leader, General Abdurrahman Chiani, has once again accused France of attempting to destabilize the country through Benin following the expulsion of French troops engaged in counterterrorism effort. In a recent interview marking Niger's independence anniversary, Chiani claimed that French intelligence agents removed from Niger have been relocated to Nigeria and Benin. He alleged these agents, along with elements of the Beninese armed forces, are involved in subversive activities. Niger's new government, which took power last July, has shifted its international alliances and accused neighboring Benin of harboring French bases, a claim both Benin and France deny. This has led to ongoing diplomatic tensions and disputes within the region. During the week in Liberia, the Office for the Establishment of War and Economic Crimes Court in Liberia has outlined a number of guidelines geared towards accelerating the establishment of the court. Since the end of the Liberian Civil War in 2003 that led to the death of more than 250,000 people, the country's new president, Joseph Bwakai, a few months ago constituted the Office of War Crimes to bring to book wallets and their financiers. WADR Zalintin Papa has a report. President Joseph Bwaka constituted a team empowering it to develop appropriate guidelines as well as source international assistance for the establishment of the court 
at a day-long event in Monrovia. The institution's director of outreach, George Wisner, said the institution has embarked on a massive awareness across the country for the establishment of the cult. Education is also, but also continual advocacy to ensure that even those implementers of the World Grand Cult are also held accountable. You development partners, you have an obligation to help Liberia in the pursuit of justice. The TOR of this office is to ensure it works out the methodology, the mechanism, as well as mobilize the necessary resources for the establishment of the court. In remarks, the national chairman of the Liberia NGOs Network, Stephen Noma, said his organization, which comprises more than 25 NGOs, will endeavor to create awareness through all the length and breadth of the country. That the massive awareness for the special court of Salome is the trial of the president of the United States, Donald Trump, and his children. For now, many Liberians are anticipating that the War Crimes Office will accelerate the process to who are accountable those bearing the greatest responsibility for the decade-long civil war that ended in 2003. Let's round off in Nigeria, which will be our focus of discussion today. Now the end bad governance demonstrations scheduled for 10 days will end this Saturday. According to many, the message has been duly passed to the president and any resistance will see further demonstrations. Meanwhile, the Take It Back movement, a leading organizer of the End Bad Governance nationwide protest, in conjunction with other protest organizers, has announced plans for a massive one million man protest across all 36 states and the Federal Capital Territory, FCT Abuja, this Saturday, August 10. According to Mr. Sanyolu Juwan, nation coordinator of the movement, this event marks a critical juncture in their nationwide campaign, which began on August 1, 2024. The protest, which aims to bring attention to the challenges faced by citizens, has garnered massive support nationwide with good turnout in northern state. Despite President Boratinubu's appeal for demonstrators to pause and give his government more time to respond to their grievances, the protests have continued unabated in Abuja, Kano and other areas. And that's the much we can take. It back to you, Imo. Thank you, Oge, for the stories that made headlines during the week. But do join us tomorrow, Sunday, for a full package on West Africa in seven days. Don't, don't, don't go anywhere. Weekly Top News will be right back. And we're back. Weekly Top News. Welcome back. This is Weekly Top News. Well, let me remind you again that Weekly Top News will now be Citizens Hour. The new name will debut on the 31st of this month with a special debate. Yes, so keep this date in mind and with promises to be very, very inclusive. Our conversation this week focuses on Nigeria. Nigerians began a 10-day and bad governance protest on the 1st of August 2024 and is expected to end this Saturday. They took to the streets to demand economic and political reforms, including the reversal of some government policies. I mean, policies like the removal of the petrol subsidy and the floating of the Naira, which have led to Nigeria's worst cost-of-living crisis in a generation, as prices of goods and services more than doubled. Well, the protest began peacefully, but took a different turn violently in some states like Kano, Kaduna and Sokoto, leading to death and destruction of property. Our conversation today focuses on how young people can be agents of change in politics. Many say the current protests by young people are one way of safeguarding the Nigerian situation. Well, it reminds the ruling class of the need to prioritize their interests and listen to their plights. 
Demonstrations have always been a successful means of highlighting the need to respect the principles of democracy. We will also look at the actions described by the Nigerian military as a treasonable offense flying the Russian flag during these demonstrations. But first, let's start with speaking with our guest, Mr. Kopeb Dabagab, General Secretary, West African Civil Society Forum, Waxoff. The 10 days and bad governance protests ends this Saturday. Uh, do you think the messages that the uh, say largely Nigerians now, because at some point um, you would agree with me that some Nigerians, whether they came out or not, wanted that demonstration to happen, to actually send a message to the government you know, about the current state of pe- the population. Do you think this message has been passed? And do you think the government is ready to respond to this uh, message? Uh, thank you so much. Um I think, um, first of all, before I even delve into Nigeria, I would say the spirit of the protest in Nigeria at the moment links up with the general spirit of disillusionment and dissatisfaction across the whole of Africa. Mm. And uh, we are increasingly, as I said, uh, during our, uh, when, when last I was on your program, yes. uh, as I said, um, it is increasingly seeming obvious that Africans, the only way they can achieve change is through protest, as we have seen in Senegal, as we have seen in Kenya, and now we are trying that uh, medicine in Nigeria. And yes, uh, the Nigerian protests have really underscored the current situation in Nigeria, the current situation of hardship, uh, the current situation of hyperinflation, mm. the current situation of a crashing economy the current uh, situation of government indifference and even, I would say, uh, punitive profligacy in the face of, you know, uh, citizens' uh, dissatisfaction. And of course, on the photo, is it the fifth day of the protest, we saw the president coming out to address the nation. Mr. Dabagat, before you continue, sir, uh, let me just quickly chip this in. Yes. Why did it have to take the president of the federation five good days into the demonstration before addressing Nigerians? Oh, well, um, funny enough, before the protest, we have uh, seen the allegation coming out that the government has spent six billion naira in trying to control the protest. Hmm. You know, and uh, jokingly, I ask people. Whose pocket is that money being lined up? You know, whose pocket does that money find its way into? Because it is a protest. It is a constitutionally guaranteed right, mm. you know, and the people are to, uh, to be allowed to protest. And people are supposed to even be provided security and make to make sure that they are, you know, secured where they are protesting. Rather, the government has tried to prevent the protest. So, uh, and I think perhaps they thought the protest would not be as serious as it eventually turned out to be. Uh, That is why perhaps the government took up to six days, you know, to respond. And uh, I think also practically, uh, part of why the government took that long to respond was because, you know, there were now increasing some incidences of violence, you mm. know, uh, in the protest. So government had to come out and try to prevent it from escalating and descending into a, you know, a total chaos across the country. Um, and then I would I would also add that uh, the tune of the protests now also began to change in some parts of the country, particularly yeah. in the northern part of the country where we saw a group of protest demands, uh, because I wouldn't say they were not protesters. They were genuine protesters. Mm. But perhaps they had, a, a, they had a different set of demands that didn't come out at the beginning, you know. And these demands include, one, you know, for the military to take over. Two, 
they were flying Russian flags, mm. which is an open invitation <laughs> for Russia, <laughs> you know, to have a footstool in, in Nigeria, you know. And Ted, we saw that those protests in those places that became violent began to take a rowdy tone with a lack of organization, mm. you know, with mobs moving, you know, according to the, the you know, uh, the, the rules of mob justice, you know. Yeah. And that, that was something that the government needed to respond to. You know, so we saw curfews being imposed in several of the states. I think uh, Kano, Jigawa, Yobe, Adamawa, and then eventually Kaduna and Plato were imposed. And what, what really happened was that it was clearly in those places, the protest or part of it or segments of it was beginning to turn, you know, uh, uh, adopt some elements of criminality, you know, and, and, and the government had to had to respond. Mm. There have been also reported loss of lives. Uh, we commiserate with the, with the families uh, of the people who have lost loved ones uh, during this protest. But mm. uh, the fundamental thing still remains. People have the right to protest. Government has, you know, the obligation to provide, you know, cover and security for the protesters and to respond to the demands. And so far, I think uh, there is no clear evidence that the government has responded adequately. Hmm. Because if you hear after the president broadcast, if you hear, you know, you listen to the comments of... Uh, several people in the protest uh, arenas, you realize that it has only succeeded in angering Nigerians. And what really did the president say? He mentioned a few measures, policies that, they have, that his government has had put in place. Uh, but none of these policies really addressed any of the points of demands hmm. of, the, of the initial protest. And I would like to just quickly outline some of these demands. I okay. would like to outline five distinct uh, uh, demands from this protest. First, it was uh, a demand. First, it includes a demand for reforms, several uh, set of reforms, including electoral reforms, including reforms in terms of government procurement and contracting processes. You know, and second, it demanded uh, a cut in the cost of governance. Mm. You know, particularly, uh, you know, the huge amounts of allowances, salaries, and emoluments given to legislators, executives, judges, and all that. It also demanded, you know, an urgent move to address national, nationwide insecurity across the country. Uh, it also demanded, you know, the need for government to rise and address increasing profligacy in, govern in government spending. You know, we've seen the amount being budgeted for the renovation of the vice president or the building of the vice president's residence you know, in billions of Naira. We've seen also in the budget, a mention of the purchase of a presidential yacht, you know. Oh. We've seen also in the budget, a mention of, you know, an expansion of the presidential fleet, you know, uh, of aircraft, you know. Oh. Also, there was also a demand to address specific micro economic issues, issues of food prices, issues of hyperinflation, uh, issues of minimum wage, interest rates, electricity, and, and uh, uh, tariffs, fuel subsidy, and all that, and then uh, and housing as well. And then 
a demand for the creation of economic opportunities or job opportunities because most of the youths have mentioned that they are jobless. So the speech of the president did not really address any of this. these oh. key points yeah, of the protest. He mentioned that uh, several hundred and uh, fifty trucks or so, or so were distributed across of, of rice were distributed across the country. And in fact, in one of the clips of the protest, I saw one of the protesters mentioning categorically, we don't need rice, we can buy rice. <laughs> All we need is for you to improve our conditions of living, mm. you know. Well, we can produce our rice, we can buy our it, rice. Mr. Davagad, where did we, we even get it wrong? I mean, this administration, uh, some people say it was on day one. May 29, when yeah. the president was being sworn in, and he announced that immediately fuel subsidy has been removed starting from that moment. Uh, would you say this problem that Nigeria has started from that moment? Yes. Um, I will also I will again start with a joke. Uh, because I, I noticed that uh, during the campaigns, there were... That issue of fuel subsidy was a main campaign issue. Hmm. I mean, all the three leading candidates mentioned it that they were going to take out fuel subsidy. You know, and uh, immediately after the first speech of the president, where he announced the removal of subsidy, uh, and things began to, you know, go down, you know, uh, hmm. spiraling. Uh, there were there was this joke that came out. They said uh, the president heard from Peter Obi and Atiku that they were going to remove subsidy, but he did not ask them how how they were going to do it. He just went ahead <laughs> and just removed it without a plan, you know. But I mean that is that captures the true picture of things, you know, because. Removal of fuel subsidy just by fiat like that, you know, is one of the main things that has landed us here. If you look at the history of the economic history of Nigeria mm. from the 80s, you realize that the, the increasing, you know, pri uh, cost of living has been tied to fuel prices. Anytime the fuel price changes, inflation happens. Prices of goods in the market happen. Transportation increases and all that, you know. Mm. So it is a major cause of the current situation in Nigeria. And um, practically, you would see that, yes, the removal of subsidy has actually made more money available to government for spending, but I mean, there was no plan attached to the spending of this money. Um, I know uh, some of the monies that were given to the state government in billions were, were simply, you know, I would say wasted because they were not, they were not spent according to any plan. Mm. Some of the state governments bought trucks and trucks of rice, imported rather, oh. trucks and trucks of rice, fertilizer, maize, you know, mm. without really caring how that hurts the economy. I expected that perhaps such monies would have gone into, uh, you know, providing cushioning effects for our local producers, our local food producers, rather it that was important. Yeah, exactly. It became a largesse, an opportunity for largesse, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, so so we are we have not been able to put in place a foundation, you know, that will help people to even naturally grow up, you know, to face the hardships that it provides, you know. And then most of these uh, uh, palliatives that were provided 
a lot of it was siphoned by public officials. Go to the market today, you see a lot of the fertilizers that were distributed by the government in the market. You see a lot of the rice and the maize that were distributed in the market, you know. Oh. Um, so, so where are we, really? Where are we? We are killing our own local productivity. Mm. Well, well, sir, let me take you up on uh, the fact that uh, this era seems to be an era of um, uh, awakening. Let me put it that way. Uh, the Gen Z terms of work, uh, where young people seems to want to be taking charge of, you know, the government. Uh, maybe young people are just tired of how the government, not just in, in Nigeria, but across the sub-region has been. Yeah. Are you saying this is the era where we can see young people save democracy? Is that possible to get young people to save democracy? Well, um, I would say yes and no. Yes, because the young people have the energy to demand for the right things to be done. Mm. And they can go on the streets and face whoever is there to be faced when the hardships get bad. But, I mean, in terms of governance, now that is a different ball game entirely. What we need in Africa, in West Africa, is good governance. What we need is genuine democracy. You know, I, I, I recall in several uh, instances, I have called for us to have a genuine conversation, a serious conversation about what democracy means to us. Because as far as I am concerned, a democracy that is hinged only on the periodic conduct of elections, whether they are free and fair, whether they are, you know, credible or not, it's not a democracy. You know, mm. as far as I'm concerned, a governance system, whether it is democratically installed there or not, you know, is, is, is such, you know, experiences or displays such level of corruption, whereby you know, it only draws the country backward. It's not a democracy. Democracy, the ends of democracy is supposed to be development. You know, a government that does not produce development cannot be uh, said to be democratic. And also a government that, you know, is marked by impunity, by, you know, draconian laws, by laws that, you know, shrink the civic space, it's not a democracy. And and increasingly, that's what we're seeing across the West African region. Yes, that is what we're seeing across the West African uh, region. We've seen uh, governments trying to elongate, elongate their stay in, in office. We've seen governments waking up overnight and dissolving uh, the legislature before the time, even against the, the precepts of the protocols of the ECOWAS uh, 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 organization. Oh. We've seen governments trying to, you know, stifle opposition. We've seen governments trying to block, you know, the flow of public opinion, block the um, the activity of citizens, the, the rights of citizens to have a say in the processes. These are not democratic values, you know. Oh. So uh, what we need are leaders, real leaders that really understand what democracy, how, how democracy can actually take root in West Africa. Um, I can also draw our mind to uh, studies that have been conducted about what about how West Africans feel about democracy? And I think uh, Afrobarometer has been popular for that over the years. They have been taking several surveys. And these surveys have revealed basically that West Africans, or should I say Africans, mm. love democracy, embrace democracy, you know. But the authoritative tendencies of our leadership, you know, um, has limited the level to which they can experience this 
uh, democracy. And finally, I would say the structure or the configuration of ECOWAS at the moment actually reinforces, you know, that uh, deficit of democracy across the region. Why? Because um, ECOWAS definitely has to turn a blind eye, mm. you know, to the happenings in the different countries because of this issue of, you know, sovereignty, of this issue of uh, the heads of states. But, but, but Mr. Dabigat, it seems ECOWAS... Yeah, it seems ECOWAS have learned a lesson because in the last couple of months, they seem to have been proactive, holding series of meetings, um, releasing series of statements, and the latest, which is the meeting of the uh, Committee of the Defense, uh, uh, Chief of Defense Staff uh, in the ECOWAS region. Uh, is this like a wake-up call? <laughs> with, with, like you mentioned, with the Russian flag, you know, uh, you know, brought in during the during the the demonstration in Nigeria, is this a wake, a wake up call to all the defense chiefs in the sub region? Well, absolutely. In fact, I would I would want to believe that there are more Russian flags in West Africa than in than in uh, Russia itself at the moment. <laughs> Even the way we have seen Russian flags in Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali, and now in Nigeria, you know. Uh, that is just on a lighter note. Right. But you see, the fundamental challenge of the ECOWAS you know, situation goes beyond just releasing statements. It, it, it actually has to do with the workings of the, uh, of the ECOWAS itself, mm. the, the fundamental nature of the workings of the ECOWAS. And that is why across board there has been calls for reforms within the ECOWAS. Let me give you some examples. Okay. Um, now we have what ECOWAS calls the ECOWAS Vision 2050, which is like a development blueprint to guide, you know, how ECOWAS carries out its business between now and 2050. You know? Mm. And that document was developed without even a level of consultation with the people. And the theme of the, the document says, from echoes of states to echoes of people, you know? Mm. So uh, clearly, ECOWAS wants to put people at the forefront of its policies and programs. But the people have not been consulted you know mm. and there were there are studies that have been done in fact i participated in some of the finalization of these studies by uh, the um frankfurt international uh, center for peace you know mm. and basically this this these studies were supposed to check to see how ECOWAS citizens, you know, understood the role of ECOWAS, responded to the rules of ECOWAS, responded to the policy of ECOWAS. And it, it revealed very clearly that the ECOWAS citizens don't even know what, you know, <laughs> what ECOWAS, mm. what the role of ECOWAS. That, that's another thing. Know. That's another area I yes. think ECOWAS really needs to, to work on. on the ground don't even know. Yes. What ECOWAS is, you know? <laughs> so that is that that is one area. Another area is that, you know, in the area of conflict management, you know, and peace support operations. Mm. Yes, we've seen how the Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali issue went. The people were ready to stand up and even fight the ECOWAS forces, mm. you know? In some other countries, you know, long before now, uh, and even right now, uh, uh, the ECOWAS, uh, you know, contingents that are there are seen more or less as occupying forces, like in the Gambia, hmm. you know, they are still there, you know, and people are beginning to see the ECOWAS forces as, as an occupier force, 
you know, <laughs> which um, you know, which should not be so. You know, hmm. so you see that that is another area. The other area is in the way the powers of the authority of heads of state and government vis-a-vis -vis the other institutions of ECOWAS. You know, as far as I'm concerned, the only body that issues decisions that decides on anything ECOWAS is the authority of heads of state and government. Mm. Yes, the, um, the ECOWAS commission is supposed to implement the programs that have been approved, but it has no right to even innovate, you know, in, in, in the situation whereby the proposals that are made are inimical to the, um, to the objectives of a government in power, for example. You know, mm. the ECOWAS Commission definitely has to, you know, bow. For example, I recall one of the Mediation and Security Council meeting earlier this year, before the elections in Senegal, after the ECOWAS had put out a very strong statement against the government uh, attempt to elongate its stay in power. You know, when they came to the meeting, the government of Senegal protested against the agenda and said that it was going to walk out of the meeting if the issue of Senegal was not taken off the agenda. Huh. And it had to be taken off the agenda for the meeting to, to hold. You know, move. Then again, you have the ECOWAS Parliament, you have the ECOWAS Court of Justice, who are on their own side, only advisory bodies. You know, huh. even where they even where the court issues judgments, the country is at liberty not to obey. Even where, you know, and the parliaments themselves are not elective or appointive. So you have to be in the good books of the government of your country. Then you are selected to go to the Equus Parliament, like a, a sort of reward. Yeah. You know, so, you know, so you see, these are genuine areas of, you know, reforms that ECOWAS needs to look into. We need a situation whereby, you know, the ECOWAS parliament will become an elective position. And not an appointed one, you which know. we're saying now. Yeah, because, I mean, what we are following as our pattern in West Africa is the EU. We are following the example of the EU. Mm. So we have all these institutions. We need to graduate them to the level of the EU, because the European uh, uh, Court of Justice will issue a judgment and all the countries in Europe will obey. Hmm. The European Parliament will issue a resolution uh, and issue a law, and all the countries will obey, you know, hmm. will obey and take the necessary measures, you know, but it's not the same with West Africa. So. You find out that the the the, um, the governments in each of these countries control maximally what happens mm. in ECOWAS. Well, in, you if, know, and in yeah. terms of in terms of in terms of you know the ratings of uh, these governments, there are a lot of questions being asked about how several of these governments came to power. There are a lot of questions being asked about the extent to which they, they are actually following the part of development. You know, mm. there are increasing pointers towards high rates of corruption across the region. So, where are we? Mm, indeed. Well, in rounding up this conversation, Mr. Davigat, uh how can we achieve that democracy uh, we really want? Because I know it's been a subject of uh, several, um, I mean, uh, discussions. How can we get that type of democracy that we want, the democracy of the people? Or do we have to look for another type of democracy that fits us as West Africans or as Africans? Is there something else that is different from the offing aside, you know, uh, military government coming in, like what we've seen in the Sahelian states. What else would you recommend? 
Well, I think a lot of a lot there are a lot of things about the liberal democratic practice that are fundamentally not in tune with our long held traditional systems of value and you know of the way we organize ourselves you know first of all we even see all our countries when we go across the entire african uh, africa uh, only a few of these countries have been able to integrate their administrative systems with the traditional system that they, uh, existed before colonialism you know mm. um so in most of the african countries we exist dualist society there is a traditional society and there's a modern society that has been superimposed and these two do not connect you know first of all if we are going to have a democracy these two must connect if we are saying okay we have a traditional system of values then we have to integrate those systems into our democratic system you know that is one secondly even in terms of the way we view things you know which uh, i would i would mention two things that are that uh, can be dismissed can seem trivial but these are fundamental things about african culture that truncates the practice of democracy one is the sense of justice in the african traditional african society when you commit an offense and you are being uh, given a punishment mm. it is not really to instill hardship on you but it is to reconcile you with the society so that is why in the villages where you commit an offense they tell you to go and bring 10 goats 5 gallons of beer <laughs> and they come they share it among the community as a way of as a reparation mm. so sort of mm. <laughs> but in the modern just this system once you are caught with any offense you are sent to jail and in fact most of our jails are not properly taken care of you know so that is you know that is one secondly um this issue of having a deputy in any office mm. it's not an african idea you know it's nowhere in the african psyche you know that is why you see even if there are, there are presidents and state governors you realize that the deputies are not really engaged in the governance process because as far as we are concerned i am the man in charge Hmm. This deputy is just there to help me as figure out votes. Exactly. You know? So, I mean, there are a lot of other, you know, very simple issues like that that will point to us that, look, this system of liberal democracy is not really fit for our society. And hmm. we need to have, it is the conversation that we need to have, a very bold conversation. And it requires you know leaders that really have this kind of orientation you know to take it forward mm. but as far as we are concerned our leadership tries as much as possible to conform you know to the demands of the west because they need favors in loans and grants and these loans are loans they collect and spend lavishly you see where you know these protests are coming from because there is really irresponsible spending in government uh, across Africa. And democracy is supposed to put this in check, but our democracies are not able uh, 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 to do that. You know, mm. um, once there's a man at the top, everything boils down to his table, everything boils down to what he says. Mm. You know, mm. even if there are institutions that are supposed to check, you know, mm. his uh, activities, they don't check his activities, uh, and he can actually even hold them to ransom through impunity because he is the man in charge. Mm. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Davagat, for uh, your time and uh, uh, 
uh, talking to us on this uh, democratic issues bothering not just Nigeria, but almost everyone here in the sub-region. Thank you so much again for your time. And please do have a great weekend. Thank you, Imo. And uh, it's always a pleasure to be with you on this program. That was Mr. Kopep Dapagat, General Secretary, West Africa Civil Society Forum, Waxoff. Also, the protests in northern Nigeria, particularly Kaduna, Kano, and some other states, took a surprising turn when protesters began waving Russian flags. This prompted the Chief of Defense Staff, General Christopher Musa, to describe it as a treason. Well, let's take a listen to that excerpt of the speech. We are warning in, in clear terms, and the president has also said we should convey this, that we will not accept anybody, any individual flying any foreign flag in Nigeria. That is treasonable offense, and it will be viewed and treated as such. So nobody should allow himself to be used by any individual. Also the issue of coups. Nigeria is a sovereign nation. Nigeria is a democratic nation. All security agencies are here to defend democracy and make sure that democracy continues to strive. We will not accept anyone pushing or taking any action, seemingly or for whatever reason, to want to push for any change of government. Now, we spoke with a constitutional lawyer, by Sir Fred Nziako, on this issue. Take a listen. It is more or less than ignorance of the the strict principle of law for anybody to say that the waving of the flag is a treasonable offense. I think the government, especially the security agencies, use the word treason just to intimidate the people and um, drive them out of the streets. But I can tell you that most of those people who were waving the flags didn't even understand what they were doing, neither did they even know the source uh, or the import or significance or the flag they were waving. Uh, one can only begin to talk about prison if, um, as defined by our constitution, if one does anything that will not only intimidate the government, but goes further to put in into action anything that will topple the government. Um, the issue of um, one waving flag, don't, don't forget that Nigeria recognizes that a citizen can hold dual, citizen, dual citizenship in which case a citizen can hold the citizenship of Nigeria and the citizenship of another country. Many of our leaders hold citizenship of uh, countries like America, Britain, Saudi Arabia, and some other countries of the, of the world. And, and, uh, and uh, in, some, in some homes, and even in some public and uh, social places, you will see flags of other countries hoisted. In some of these religious organizations, like the churches, especially the Pentecostal churches, you see multiple flags of various countries hosted in those places. In some hotels in Nigeria, you see many flags of other countries hosted in those places. So anybody who says those children waving the Russian flag had committed treason, uh, the fellow really does not understand what he's talking about in terms of law, in terms of um, practice, and in terms of of a precedence. There's been a division on this argument on social media platforms, those who are for and those who are against that statement. And many argue that perhaps it, it was set to deter further use of these flags and maybe also the fact that there's been an ideology being sold to the people, which, which of course was characterized by the call for a coup. Even a call for coup does not amount to treason. A call for coup is an expression is an expression of frustration and disappointment. Because in law we talk about actus rules and mens rea, the intentions and the action. If um, intention alone does not amount to action, one can begin to talk about treason if the action so presents itself that the fellow had moved in the direction of treason. Well, see, talking about some legal issues tied to um, this, uh, the, the ongoing uh, hashtag uh, and bad governance protest, we understand that the Nigerian Immigration Service, NIS, said this week that it has um, identified some uh, sponsors of the protests who are in the diaspora. And should they uh, attempt to travel back to the country, they will be arrested and handed over to the appropriate uh, security agencies. Is it a crime under the Nigerian constitution for anybody to contribute to protests? 
I think um, the head of immigration was only trying to say the things Mr. President would like to hear. The head of immigration was only trying to be nice before the international community. There is nothing wrong in protest. Absolutely nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, it's a fundamental right of the citizens around the world to protest whenever they feel they are being given the short end of the knife. The, the people in the diaspora, or even those within Nigeria, who were identified as the organizers and the arrowheads of the protest, have committed no offense to have organized the protest. They were not the ones that asked those to go and commit crime. They are not. It is the duty of the government to arrest those who committed crimes, and then those ones who committed crimes will now answer for themselves, uh, because nobody sent them. Those who went and uh, burned down offices and destroyed cars and other things, nobody sent them. Those are the criminals, uh, because it is like uh, 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 ask, uh, 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 holding the, the baboon guilty for the offense of the dog in the same compound. That is wrong. By Sir Fred Zako there, a constitutional lawyer. And that's how we wrap things up on this edition of Weekly Top News on West Africa Democracy Radio, 94.9 FM, Dakar. Well, we would love to hear from you. Do send us an email to wadr at wadr.org. Thank you for listening and many thanks to our listeners on our partner stations, Voice of Liberia FM 104.1 in Monrovia and Kwateka Radio 100.9 FM Bong County. In Ghana, we say thank you to our listeners on Radio Pod in Savannah region. We also thank our listeners on Albarica Radio 97.5 FM, Bauchi and Darling FM 107.3 Uwari South East Nigeria and on African Young Voices 101.6 FM Freetown and Radio Bath 91.3 FM Mile 91 in Sierra Leone and Hilltop Radio in the Gambia. Do join us next week as we build up to a special debate coming up at the last Saturday of this month of August. I am Emo Edit. Bye for now. <laughs>